author, best-selling author of Black AF History, The Unwhitewashed Story of America, Mr. Michael Harriet is here. Hello. Hey, and thank you for having me. <laughs> okay, is that your podcast voice? <laughs> That's your race. Hey. <laughs> yes. Hey, how are you? How That's are when you? I restrict my vocal cords. <laughs> yes, that sounds it sounds amazing. Um, first of all, congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. I feel like uh like 80% of the people who bought the book are from just judging from the book signings and the events are Nubians or either Karen Rebels, uh, because everybody told me, hey, I'm a Karen Rebel, I'm a Nubian. So it's like it's thanks to our grassroots efforts that uh most of these people bought the book. Always. Um and yes. Thank you, audience, family members. I, I don't take that lightly because I feel like we built a community and this is what we expect from our community. When we put goodness out that they support it, we're going to save ourselves. It's the only way it's going to happen. It's not going to come from, you know, top down organizations. It's going to be us on the grassroots supporting the efforts so that people like you can do more. People like me can do more. So I'm just really grateful to have this audience. Uh, I promise you carefully cultivated, amazing human beings. So shout out to everybody, everybody in Nubia as well. Um, for that, you know, what waking up to a bestseller, I remember, you know, the first book that I did and when it landed on a list, I didn't even know what it meant. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I didn't know what it meant. And then the second book was on the extended list. I didn't know what that meant. And then it was like, you know, this kind of thing that you wait to see on the Tuesday, whether, you know, the numbers are going to come in because the folk inside know before it actually gets published. When did you get the call? I got the call uh, Wednesday afternoon. So it usually comes out Wednesday evening. I got the call uh, Wednesday afternoon. And earlier that day, my agent, uh, she had been calling me. was like, Mike, are you nervous? And I'm like, wait, nervous about what? And I didn't even know. <laughs> and that's when she told me that we were waiting for the for the list to come out. And so when she the whole team called me and they were so shocked and surprised and glad. And so was I, because like I still kind of don't know what it means. But by the professionals inside the industry uh, being so happy, I assumed that it meant really something good. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, it means sales for a particular week. And it depends on what else came out that particular week and in, in, in your same category. Um, you're in a category with uh, the great Walter Isaacson, who did a book with uh, Steve Jobs and like everybody. He's got a book out right now about Elon Musk. I, um, I'm debating on whether I should read it. Um, you're on the list with Aster. We were just talking about this book, uh, Anderson Cooper's book. We were talking about it because CBS Sunday Morning just did this whole thing on the Aster's the, criminal horrible ass family you know one of the founders <laughs> of capitalism in america uh mark levin's book is number one but i think it has a little uh cross next to it because dagger. what people don't yeah. know right there's a dagger because people like mark levin who uh, he has an amazing uh huge audience and following People don't know. I think he's done 11 books. All of them have sold over a million copies. People don't know that. They don't know that he all of his books have been on the bestsellers list. And it's because his audience that uh, the same people that followed uh, Rush Limbaugh, the same people that love Donald Trump. That's his audience. They have conventions and conferences. And so there are people that buy maybe 20, 30,000 copies of the book and then give them away at different events. But that counts, right? I mean, that's a bestseller. Right. But it's it's you know it's not like yours, where individuals. I mean, well, maybe let me ask: Did you have a major corporation purchase like twenty, thirty thousand copies of Black AF history and give them away at the NAACP nope. conference or something, or the to the Congressional Black Cau Cau Caucus? Did they give it away? I wish uh, that would have happened, but no, I didn't. As a matter of fact, what's interesting and why I brought up the Karen Rebels and Nubians at the beginning is like I didn't have any of the traditions. Like I didn't have an uh, op-ed in the New York Times. Um, they pitched that and I was like, nah, like black people got it. And they were saying, well, how about the the white? I was like, nah, black people got it. And so I didn't go on any of the daytime shows or the nighttime shows. I went on Joy Read and that's it. So it was really a grassroots kind of people who know me. And the interesting thing was, so when I did the book tour, I told them that I only wanted to do independent and black owned bookstores. 
And so what was interesting about that is when I went to the black owned bookstores, they would always have enough copies. Uh, they weren't surprised by the crowds. Some of the black owned bookstores wouldn't have it in their bookstores because they knew there wouldn't be enough space. And the white owned bookstores always ran out of books. Like, I don't think they knew that black people were waiting for this book. So they'd run out of books uh, in Atlanta. We ran out of books in Atlanta, um, in Charleston. Uh, they were grabbing them out of the the windows. So it was it was interesting to see that you could see from different uh, you know like data points that the white people really didn't expect or know what this book was going to do, and it was just like a bunch of black people buying it. So let me ask you, um, I, I'm in season two of Top Boy. And uh, I just went back and watched the final season of Godfather of Harlem. I I loved thoroughly John Singleton Snowfall, and I've been and I'm questioning, you know, from Scarface on to you know our fascination with these criminals, you know, Denzel, you know, <laughs> playing Frank Lucas, you know, you we we're rooting for them, like and, and Top Boy, I'm rooting for everybody, and I was like, this is such a brilliantly written piece because every killer and gangster, there's a backstory that makes you go, oh, you know, he's got to raise his brothers, or oh, like he did something really good in Jamaica. Who am I supposed to? What, am I supposed to not like? I like both of them. I want them both to win, but they're selling drugs to the community, so they're sowing bad seeds. Like, oh my goodness. And then you listen to our music and it's all of this debauchery. And, and then then we look at the asters in your first uh, chapter. One of your first in, introduction, you talk about the the let me let me give the exact thing. Um, not Earth, Wind in America. You, you write about the criminals. You know, you basically, you know, it's like this country was founded by rapists. Was it rapists? Kill drug. Cra oh, it's on your cover. Drug smugglers, human traffickers, you know. Did America give us this the aspiration to, you know, do these illicit things and then build a criminal justice system so that only certain people could get away with it? As we see Trump in court right now trying to fight for his um, financial life. What are your thoughts on that, Michael Harriet? Yes. Yeah, so one of the things about America that makes it so different is that America is not a country of. Well, I mean, there are natives here, but the people in America came here and uh, stole the land, for better words. One of the quotes that I say is the only difference between a burglar and a settler is who writes the police report. Uh, and that we are a country of burglars, right? Um, if the white people who came here did not write the history we would call it an invasion, right? Like that is the definition of an invasion. And that's what I kind of wanted to do with this book is to, to there are books about black history of numerous, as we both know, from black people's perspective. And there are books about America, usually through white people's perspective, but I wanted to write specifically about America and the history that we all know from black people's perspective and how we see this country as a nation of burglars, how we see the foundation of it, how we see the founding of it, and how we see the prosperity, the criminal enterprise that is the American system of government and economics and politics, and how we watch that grow. Mm. Michael Harriet is here, uh, best-selling author, Black AF History. He's got a podcast, Drapedomania, which is... Uh, quite unique in the in the acting and the way in which uh it is presented very different but you know to your point making a conscious decision to go to black owned bookstores and independent bookstores to do your book tour and not doing the quote unquote big big uh platforms you said that the white stores weren't ready and i'm going to ask this question of everyone listening and i've said this cuz i know the answer so it's a little rhetorical we live in a world through a lens, we're going to talk about language today with Tasha Austin. We live in a world where there's a, a standard <laughs> that we're all supposed to live up to, but it's also a myth. And in this standard, many of us fold and contort ourselves to fit 
the standard, which means that most people don't know each other. Well, let me correct that. Most so-called white folk don't know most so-called black people in terms of culture, right? What do we do with that? And what do we do with those who try so hard to fit into this standard that they forget who they are as well? They didn't know you. They didn't know the power that you came to the table with. I remember, you know, as a publisher arguing with folk about something, they're going to argue with me about my own people, you know, but they got the purse strings. So you usually have to capitulate to the people with the purse strings, right? So you usually have to bow to them and you didn't. So yes, all of that, they gave you a check, but you were like, no, we're going to do it this way. And number seven on the New York Times bestsellers. So you're right. Now they have to listen to you. But what about this not knowing us? Because I feel like that's part of the the main problem that we have in this country is that folk think they know people in power with money. And as a result, they make legislation and policies that impact all of us without even having a foundational knowledge of the people that you're quote unquote governing. Yeah, I I think that is correct. I would also argue that they don't know each other. White people generally don't know much about white people. And I think like a lot of this anti-CRT, anti-wokeness is an attempt to keep the history of whiteness concealed, right? So they will teach us that we saying we shall overcome during the civil rights movement, but not about what we overcame, right? And so in a sense, the not knowing each other is a really a thing that is about not knowing whiteness and what white people did and what white people, how they got their economic advantage, their political advantage and their social advantage by creating whiteness. And that in turn makes them believe that, for instance, if we just focused on education and if we just, you know, did the things that we think that white people did, we would get rid of these disparities. When the truth is that they didn't do any of that stuff either. And back to your point, that assimilating and doing what they say will not work. It will not erase these things. It will not undo the discrimination. It will not undo the disparities. You know, like when we said, for instance, like they say, well, if Black people just focused on education. And one of the examples that I use is that Black people came to this country without a language and without, you know, knowing what this country entailed. Their only purpose was to have their labor extracted and their intellectual property extracted and then for them to die. And we said, well, we got to learn, first of all, the language and how to read and write it. And we did it so well that they had to make laws to ban us from doing it. They said that we will kill you if you keep doing that so well. So, and then wait, wait, so wait, after- pause, pause. I'm sorry, just because we're going to talk later with Tasha Austin about language. But most of the Africans that came from Africa to Brazil, then to Barbados, then to South Carolina, your port of entry, mine as well, we both have roots there, and then spread out into the greater thing that they now call United States of America came speaking maybe two languages, a dialect, you know, they, they, they had multiple languages in their mouths because they were trading right. with their neighbors and to come here to not speak English without being taught the phonics or anything, learned English, learned how to write to the point that they had to create laws saying if you teach a, a an enslaved person or a black person how to read and write, you could be punished. And if that black person is caught reading and writing, they probably would be killed. They made laws. What right. was the fear? In a what society, was, was, go ahead. I'm sorry. In a society, Christ. one where most of the white in the South, most of the white people were illiterate, right? And the fear was that one, the knowledge and the communication would upend the system that they created. And it wasn't just during slavery, remember, right? After after emancipation, the Black Codes, for, for instance, forbade white people from apprenticing under Black people, right? It, it, it forbade, uh, it, it forbade things like, they, 
one of the interesting things is when you go to an HBCU and there's always an old building on the campus that was built in 1904 or something like that. And they'll, it'll always say, well, the first structure was burned down by a white mob. Uh, all of the black newspapers that were burned by white mobs that so we have no archives of them. And then after even during the civil rights, what we call the civil rights movement, right? They we allowed our, our children to go to school where they would be spat at and called names to get an equal education. The black people of the 1868 South Carolina Charleston de delegation created what we know as the public education system in America. And the idea that black people do not value education when in this country, there's never been a nanosecond where we have had access to an equal education is historically inaccurate and absurd on its face. And But because people do not know white history, they believe that well, if y'all just study a little bit more, y'all will have an equal education, right? When in fact, all of like states like South Carolina and Mississippi, where they were majority white, South Carolina was majority black until 1940 census. They were paying for the economic opportunity for white people. They couldn't attend the schools they were paying for, that their textiles were being used for. They couldn't attend the colleges. They could, but even the HBCUs were land grant colleges made from federal money. So they didn't use black state tax dollars to build those HBCUs. They used black state taxpayers dollars to build the white institutions. All mm -hmm. of that economic and generational opportunity is opportunity that was taken from us and given to white people. They do not know their history of whiteness and white people which is why we have some of these narratives that are being perpetuated in history and society and the law and in education. Michael Harrod is here. Uh, 866-801-8255. We had a Drapedomania listening party uh, in Nubia a few weeks back. And um, again, it's all about unwashed history, you know, coming through unwhitewashed. Let me say that uh, history in both the podcast and now Black AF history, uh, the unwhitewashed story of America, New York Times bestseller right now. Um, you know, as you're as you're talking about that, I'm, I'm also very clear, Michael, that they don't want to know. They're very comfortable with the lie. The lie feels good. The lie perpetuates the myth that they that they want to give to their children and grandchildren. It's almost like a gift. It's almost like the Santa Claus myth. You, you want to keep that going as long as possible because it brings joy and validation. So what you're saying uh, gets you, you call it names, you know, you get some threats. People be threatening you because they're mad. They're mad at you saying these things. And when we, we talk about it this, this weekend, Dr. Carr said, what would it look like if we didn't have whiteness? And people were like, you know, I saw some folk coming to the, the chat on the YouTube side, like, Oh, this is racist. <laughs> you know, it was like, to explore a made up construct is racist. Like we can't have a conversation. And then I keep asking this question. Why do you want to be wedded to something that is so aligned with the oppression of other people? Why is that something that you're joyful about? Why not just take it off and put it over there where it belongs? What do you think is the resistance to doing that? Michael Harriet? Well, I think one of the resistance things, and, and we talk about this in Nubia all of the time for a lot of people don't know that like black history it's fairly new. Like my parents, there was no black history in school, none, right? Like they didn't learn about slavery. Like the black history and the black studies movement is mostly a, a movement nationwide that emerged in the late 60s, early 70s. So the people who are teaching the people who teach history didn't know anything about black history. So that's part. So it sounds like a lie when everything that you've learned didn't include the things that we know and we are saying. So that's part of it. And the other thing is when you think about at the beginning of our conversation, when you go back to those ideals of this nation built of rugged individualism and hard work and, you know, merit that it upends that myth of like, when you learn about head rights and how the blue bloods got their economic 
advantage from slavery, not from the things that slavery produced, but they got 50 acres of land for every enslaved person they bought over here. So it wasn't like wait, what pause, they did pause. With this is in, but hold on, hold on. Don't just gloss over. Folk needed to just drop some of this. The rest you got to get in the book. And you can listen to the audio. A lot of people in Nubia right now said the audio book. You even read the foot footnotes. I got the physical book. Uh, but the audio, however you get it, you're you, it's all black AF history. So folk came here for every person they own. What happened, Michael? So remember, like the the Virginia colony was a, a investment. Um so it was aristocrats who first came over here and they didn't know how to build stuff. They didn't know how to grow plants. And so remember the first uh, settlers, all but nine of the first 109 settlers starved to death. They had to eat. They resorted to cannibalism. So they came up with the policy. Hey, if you bring people over here who know how to do stuff, uh, we'll give you 50 acres of land if you pay their way over here for every person you pay they were over here. So in 1638, a man named George Menifee realized, hey, if I don't bring indentured servants and just bring the enslaved Africans, I'll get 50 acres of land and don't ever have to free them. So he received 3,000 acres of land what? for, what? quote, the Negroes I brought out of Africa. The head right boom burst. Right. And South Carolina was created out of head rights. Wait, and hold so on, hold on, wait, was... hold on. Stop. You're going too fast, Michael Harriet, because this needs to sit in people's souls right now. So a very and maybe he wasn't very rich. A man that had a vision <laughs> said, wait a minute, because prior to this, the Irish and some of the criminals from from England had a choice. You either go to a British prison, which was really horrible, or you can go to this place called America, which is also maybe really scary. They did the same thing with Australia. Let open their prisons. Here you go. And this man said, mm, now I'm going to have to those indentured people because there was no whiteness at this point. I'm going to have to free them. I'm going to have to free them at some point. But the Africans, I don't have to free. At, at, so let me at all. Right. After seven years, the indigenous servants got their freedom, which is where we got the concept of seven years, your debts fall off like that. We're still on that economic oh. system, which is why Equifax, you know, your your stuff falls off of Equifax credit report after seven years. It's from that. It go dates back to the Bible. Um, and so that principle was upended by enslaved people out of Africa who were brought over here. They didn't ever have to free them. They couldn't read the contracts if they even had a contract. They didn't. But that perpetual intergenerational, inescapable, race based servitude that extracted labor and intellectual property by reducing people to chattel is uniquely American. Right. None of those people, unlike all of the slavery that existed in the history of the world, those people were not involved in conflicts. They were not part of nations that were involved in conflicts. Most of them were just people who were living their lives and enslaved specifically for a capital for a capitalist purpose. And that is how the wealth of America was born, not from the things specifically that the enslaved people produced, because we taught them how to grow the stuff. We taught them how to build the stuff. Like the reason those big colonial houses are not air conditioning and don't need air conditioning is because the enslaved people knew how to build stuff where the air flowed through. Um, and they bought that out. Virginia's biggest e export was blacksmithing. America's form of blacksmithing is an African form where they went specifically to where they knew that that art form was um, rice, the rice culture. Those were agriculturalists and horticulturalists. And like what a, a few years ago, I had to write this uh, this piece on the plantation tourism industry and the plantation, which was 1700 acres, still exists to this day. And someone asked, well, how did it survive what was recently this, what they called a hundred years flood? And they said, well, the dams and levees that the Africans built 300 years ago, oh, they still work. And when we know a storm is coming, we just flood the parts of the plantation and dam it up. And then when the storm, recede, when the waters recede, we let the waters go. Those were the engineers who built 
They, they didn't go get strong muscles and big brawny slaves, as we were told to believe. They got engineers and horticulturalists and agricultural experts. And that's what built one of the greatest economies that, that has ever been on the face of the earth. <music> Says that she loves me. Isn't it lovely when the one who loves things is the one?